Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. A few weeks ago, my husband Drew showed me a Twitter thread from Michaela Peterson, who, if you don't know, is Jordan Peterson's daughter and is very much in line with the ideology of her father. In the thread, Michaela talked about how she wasn't ever interested in church until her husband introduced her to a certain pastor. The thread read, I've found it very difficult to go to church. Most, and I mean most, of the services I've been to throughout my life had a pastor that either felt like he was selling me something, didn't feel authentic, was seriously boring, or I had no idea what they were talking about. So when people told me to go to church, it wasn't useful because not every church has a pastor that is worth listening to and I'm not interested in wasting my time. Even marrying Jordan Fuller, it took him a while to convince me that church was important. I didn't get it. I straight up told him I wasn't going to listen to someone who sounded like they were lying to me once a week. Nope. Pastor Mark though, he's the real deal. You can tell by the feeling you get when you're at his church. His stuff is on YouTube as well if you're not in Scottsdale, Arizona. Highly recommend him if you're interested. Yeah, the pastor that Michaela is so excited about is Mark Driscoll. Now, I was a bit shocked by that. I'm pretty familiar with Mark Driscoll. As a child, I watched some of his sermons online, and I actually just finished listening to the podcast series called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. In 1994, Driscoll founded and pastored a church in Seattle called Mars Hill. He served as lead pastor until controversy in 2014 led him to resign, and the church dissolved quickly after. During its 20-year run, Driscoll school grew Mars Hill into a megachurch with over 14,000 members and 15 different locations. Mars Hill was also one of the first churches to upload footage of their services to be watched on Apple devices. Driscoll was very concerned about growing his church into basically an industrial complex. The name Mark Driscoll became a brand in itself, and he even paid to artificially inflate sales of his book, Real Marriage, to get it on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, Mark Driscoll falls perfectly into the attention-seeking pastor-turned-salesman pipeline, so it's confusing to me that Driscoll is the only pastor Michaela will listen to when she's also said that she doesn't like pastors who seem like they're trying to sell you something. The more I thought about it, though, the more I saw why someone like Michaela would gravitate towards Toward Mark Driscoll. Driscoll was known, and still is somewhat known, as evangelical Christianity's bad boy. He wears leather jackets, swears, drinks beer, and has a very aggressive and tell-it-like-it-is attitude, similar to that of Donald Trump. When Driscoll pastored Mars Hill, he ran things very autocratically. He would fire staff members for simply disagreeing with him and would steamroll pretty much anyone who got in the way of his plans for the church. He even once bragged about how there's so many dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus, dead bodies meaning those he's fired for not agreeing with him. There, there is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. <laughs> And by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. Um, you either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options. But the bus ain't going to stop. Driscoll eventually stepped down from Mars Hill after allegations of him verbally and emotionally abusing staff members. But he's since founded a church in Scottsdale, Arizona called Trinity Church. His sermons are very misogynistic, and he has an outdated view of gender roles, when he was at Mars Hill, he discouraged the wives of his staff members from seeking employment. He believes the role of a woman to be that of a homemaker who primarily tends to the needs of her husband. He's even referred to women as penis homes. In 2006, after another pastor was caught having an affair with a male escort, Driscoll tweeted out that the affair might have not happened if the pastor's wife hadn't let herself go. Yeah, fuck Mark Driscoll. His religious views and preaching is also very much intertwined with conservative talking points. He regularly discusses politics from the pulpit, and he's unsurprisingly extremely homophobic and transphobic and dedicates a very unusual amount of time to discussing these issues in his sermons. So since Driscoll is all about authority, traditional values, and making sure straight white Christian men are catered to, 
It totally makes sense to me that Michaela sees him as a pastor worth listening to and is oblivious to the fact that he is still the kind of salesman pastor she so despises. I thought today Drew and I could react to one of Driscoll's recent YouTube videos about wokeism, whatever that means. In this video, Mark and fellow Christian author Nathan Finocchio discuss how wokeism is affecting Christian churches and leading many people to leave Christianity altogether. All right, let's jump in. So just to be transparent, we're not watching the full video today. I've cut it up into clips, um, but I will link the full video down in the description if you want to watch it. So what I wanted to have was a conversation. Um, to me, it feels like whatever evangelicalism was or is, is quickly trending toward the progressive left. Yeah. Um, and I think politics definitely exacerbates that. There's political, and it used to be, don't talk about politics. Well, today, everything is political. Yeah. Po politics has swallowed everything. everything. And so I'm gonna give you a concept, and then you tell me if you think it's accurate. I was thinking about it like, um, we got a dimmer switch at my house, and you can turn it off, it's all dark. You can turn it on, it's all bright. And then there's a series of sort of settings in the middle. And my belief today is that that there are certain churches that are fully woke, meaning it's totally dark. Right. They, the gospel is not shining whatsoever. They've mm -hmm. just completely turned the, the light down. These would be your BLM, rainbow flag, alphabet soup people. Yeah. Um, they're ashamed of the gospel. They actually deny the gospel. Yeah. Uh, they're opposed to the gospel in the name of some sort of modicum of theological commitment. Right. On the other side, there are the non-woke. Those guys, they've got it turned all the way up to bright. It's about personal repentance of sin, not institutional or cultural repentance of sin. It's about Jesus and not just justice. It's about, you know, relationship with God, not just horizontal, social. It's vertical, eternal. And those are the non-woke. And then I would say in the middle that's where most are, hmm. and the younger you are, the more you've got the dimmer switch on. Right. And so, would you agree with that, 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 that we're really looking at minorities in the polarities, and most evangelical leaders, pastors, they're somewhere in that, I would call this woke, non-woke, I would call this soft woke. Yeah. I think absolutely. I think that sounds like a little bit of a, a purity test type thing mm -hmm. to like anyone who is not a hundred percent with me is basically just a soft version of my mortal enemy. Right. right? Yeah. And I, he really likes to use the term woke in a lot of things he talks about. And I find that like woke, it doesn't really have a good definition. Hey guys, editing Taylor here. I wanted to clarify that when I said that woke doesn't have a good definition, I don't mean to imply that it has no definition or that I don't understand the origination of that term and that it refers to being alert of racial prejudice that affects African Americans. What I mean to say is that when people like Mark Driscoll, when conservatives use this term, they're using it to pretty much describe anything that they don't agree with, especially things that are progressive or on the left. It kind of just means whatever the person doesn't like. Yeah, it's what we would call a buzzword. Yeah, yeah. So in Mark Driscoll's case, it's anything LGBT or like Black Lives Matter, any of that kind of thing he thinks is woke. And for some reason, if a church is supportive of LGBT rights or supportive of Black Lives Matter, then they're not real Christians. Yeah. I think it's funny how he's talking about everything is just politics based. It's all politics based. They don't care about the gospel. But then what he defines as like a real gospel community is he's saying, oh, it's all uh, it's all vertical rather than horizontal. Like he's saying that there is authoritarian, there's an authoritarian mm -hmm. structure, there's hierarchy, and then there is the people at the bottom of that hierarchy all having to hold themselves accountable as individuals. There is no accountability to your fellow man at mm -hmm. all. That is something that comes from our, I all say traditional culture, but I'm talking about a traditional culture that developed post-Christianity de developing mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like while saying that, oh, these other people are just caught up in non-Christian things, non-Christian culture, he is just as much, it's just a different kind of non-Christian or 
not necessarily Christian culture. Right. Yeah, like it's not what the culture of Christianity was even a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. It's very, or, very different. Right. I also like how he said that if you're, you know, part of the woke, that means that you're not following the gospel at all. And like, I don't see those two things as being incompatible. Yeah. I know a lot of Christians who they say they're Christians. So I believe that they are Christians who are supportive of LGBT rights. And it's just kind of sad to me that he's so willing to see a whole group of people as enemies and not even worthy of going to heaven because they disagree on one topic. Even from his Protestant Christian perspective, it is strange to me that he sees people supporting social justice as something that indicates that you are not serious about the gospel mm -hmm. with the, the Protestant version of the gospel being, you know, you have a new identity in Christ and you try to serve him and live according to his will. Uh, maybe you're born again. That's a, that's a part of it for him, I imagine. And I... I simply don't see why that is actually incompatible with having a different view of like what Paul taught about homosexuality than he does. It's mm -hmm. almost like he thinks that the things surrounding the gospel, tangential to the gospel, are actually more important than yeah. the serving Jesus and dedicating your life to him spiritually. Yeah. I think that we are so driven by, um, you know, the cultural milieu um you know we're uh we're all, all the media that we consume and and you know music movies television our friends the public school system the universities etc you know nobody wants to be mean right um our our, our highest truth is being kind um, rather than being helpful right exactly yeah again they're acting as if they're the way that they express themselves, the culture that they are in is a Christian culture mm -hmm. rather than a conservative secular culture. Yeah, which, kind of a product of the 50s. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's like you, you realize that culture, music, movies, your friends are influencing you to behave and look and act the way that you do when you're against the woke too, right? Yeah. Like, I don't I don't think that Christian culture was preserved from whatever whatever uh, the original Christian culture even was. There's a massive diversity of mm -hmm. Christian sex at the beginning of of Christianity. But I don't think that any original Christian culture was so perfectly preserved that Mark Driscoll is able to walk within that and, oh, be, and be pure. Oh, he thinks he is. <laughs> yeah, which is hilarious because you're not going to see men that look like Mark Driscoll, the pants that he wears, mm -hmm. the jacket that he wears, the way he cuts his facial hair, yeah. the way that he has to talk like this, and the, I mean, yeah. ev everything about him is completely modern. Mm -hmm. It's just modern conservatism. Yeah, they're using that Christianese saying, or kind of referencing that Christianese saying that I really hate about how you're like not supposed to be part of the culture, mm -hmm. as if they don't have a culture of their own. They kind of just use the word culture as this like catch all word. That's just, again, just like wokeism. It's kind of just meant to mean whatever you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> and also it's just like, it's such a cliche at this point to be like music and movies and our culture is influencing our kids to do X, Y, and Z. It's like people have been saying that for forever. Yeah. That has always been happening. That's always been happening, yeah. And also, what's so wrong about being kind? Isn't that kind of the main teaching of Jesus? To be kind? I think that Mark Driscoll would say maybe the, the main teaching of Jesus is no, repent and believe that he is, you know, whatever Mark Driscoll believes Jesus to be. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about... Old literature is that you can interpret it to mean a lot of different things, and that means that Jesus gets molded in our image. Yeah, well, as we keep watching, we'll see how they continue to do that. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, the younger you are, I mean, look at the look at the exit polls on the last, you know, this midterm election. Uh, once again, not that politics or anything, but it is a it's a, it is a metric of of sorts. Yeah. You know, and young people. 
I mean, uh, what is that old age old maxim? If you're young and you're not a liberal, you don't have a heart. If you're old and you, you know, you're not, a, and you're a, and you're a liberal, you don't have a brain. Yeah. Um, so there's a little bit of that too, where you know, young people are going to kind of, they're not going to lead with their head. They're going to lead with their heart, and that is, I think, a, one of the big tricks. So they're saying that. People who are woke, who are liberal, are of the world, and that, you know, politics is not what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But when people are not politically conservative, that means that they're not for Jesus. I mean, yeah. like, what, what they're saying is that you have to be a, a part of their very modern political tribe, or else you are not a part of their ancient religion yeah yeah that does not make any sense that's yeah. it's so it's so anachronistic to think that you know ancient jews looked like a guy who takes his facebook profile picture from down here <laughs> in his car with sunglasses on <laughs> yeah kind of like what i talked about in the intro to this video for Mark Driscoll, religion and politics are like the same thing. Yeah. Like they're inseparable. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to a pastor recently and he was saying, you know, we made our, our worship like cool, um, you know, and we like got into like artsy, you know, prints, you know, but, but then all of our kids thought, oh yeah, we're going woke. And, and he's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? So there is, I think sort of that, um, I kind of feel like the evangelicals in the 60s and 70s, you know, where they're like, they started to like accept, you know. Like Some a, of the cultural yeah. trappings of the hippie. Yeah, you know, Jimmy Swagger had longer hair. You know what I mean? Well, and Chuck, Chuck Smith, Papa Chuck, and the Calvary movement, yeah. you know, they don't have shoes on. They're playing guitar. Totally. They look like you, yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, they don't look, you know, like, you know, they're running for office totally. in Iowa. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, but they were conservative theologically in yeah. all intents and purposes, right? Or for all intents and purposes. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been a, you're right. There's, there's been a, a real shift. Um, and I think it has to do with the Bible being a, the absolute last priority. Yeah. <laughs> so basically what they're saying is that it's okay for them and the people that follow them to appropriate the aesthetic of a certain group of people, of the hippies or whatever. But if you actually sit there and analyze and accept some of their values, then that's wrong. You, you can't do that. It's okay for you to look like them, but to act like them, no, that's, that's not okay. Yeah, it's kind of the expression of be in the world, but not, not of, of the, the world. world. Yeah. But there's a lot, there's exactly. So, so the way that you learn something really matters and I, I i'm concerned that there's a whole generation of young people who were raised in seeker churches that never knew that jesus was lord or what the implications of that are mm -hmm. and so when you begin to confront them you know they they, they become deconstructionists you know because they've never been they've never un understood that jesus cannot be divorced from his words and jesus has some opinions on stuff and yeah, so much so that they killed him to shut him up totally so he wasn't he wasn't trending in a positive way right how often have we heard that exact thing yeah. that we're only we've only left the church because we weren't real christians or we didn't really understand what jesus was all about yeah and just like at a certain point it's like how much do we have to prove or show that we were Christians, we did understand Christianity before they'll stop saying that? Yeah. And the truth is, never. They're right. just saying that because it makes them feel comfortable and yeah, what it's they a defensive. Believe. It's, it's a defensive, defensive posture. It, it's yeah. it is basically putting distance between themselves and anyone who deconstructs. Because if you admit that someone that actually or someone that deconstructs actually knew something about Christianity, actually under understood it as well as you do, that could mean that they themselves might be mistaken mm -hmm. or could potentially deconvert in the future. Yeah. My concern is that there's Christians that have not learned Christ. And uh, were they're culturally Christian, um, and the, the teaching from the pulpit has been to the lowest common denominator, uh, but we sort of sanitized the gospel and sanitized mm -hmm. churches to try to get butts in seats. Uh, but that doesn't even work anyways because those people don't die. They don't give. They won't build with you. And they're just going to get upset with you and leave. Um, so, yeah, it's a, we're, we're in a bit of a mess. I will say that there is some empirical basis for this. Um, okay. Very strict 
or very conservative religious traditions, ones that have a lot of um, demands mm -hmm. on on their adherents, do actually keep their members for longer and reproduce and grow a bit more on average than liberal traditions where there aren't a lot of demands that you don't have yeah. to really sacrifice anything to be a part of it, where it's less, um, I won't just say less engaging, but less unpleasant. Mm. Uh, it, it seems like a bit of a paradox, but no, when you are asked to sacrifice something, when you are, are asked to give up something that costs something to you to be a part of a religion, you're less likely to leave yeah. it. So they're, they're right. Um, is it a good thing that religion is asking those things of people, making those demands of people? That's a I different question. No. And, and I mean, that totally makes sense because you're a lot less likely to leave something if there are huge consequences for you doing so. Yeah. And so for those who are looking at it, what are some of the markers that that you or your church or your ministry or the crew that you're rolling with yeah. are somewhere in that soft woke? Because with the with the hard woke, they virtue signal it. Yeah. You know, I mean. You know, they're going to be opposing uh, the Supreme Court overturning of abortion. Right. Virtue signaling. Doing something virtuous or holding to values and talking about it unashamedly. That's totally not what Ma Mark Driscoll does at all. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I hate it when people use the whole like virtue signaling thing. Meanwhile, they they are people who are like, well, I just tell it like it is. And what it is, is their moral paradigm. Yeah. They're doing the same thing, just they just have different values. Well, it's not different. And it doesn't even, it's not even, he's not being consistent because at first he was saying, oh, they're not real Christians. They don't actually follow the gospel because they genuinely believe and are supportive of all these, uh, all these things that I disagree with. And now he's saying, oh, they're just virtue signaling. Yeah, because like virtue signaling insinuates that you don't genuinely True. aren't genuinely supportive of something. It just means that you're trying to look good in the eyes of others. You're a so which is yeah. it? Are they, you know, actually believe this stuff and are therefore going to hell, or are they just doing it because they want to look good in the eyes mm. of culture or whatever? Good point. They're going to be, you know, virtue yeah. signaling with Black Lives Matter, which, good lord, as an organization, like, it, it, gosh. It's insanity. Yeah. You know, and I always say if somebody's flying a BLM flag or a rainbow flag, they've officially come out of Satan's closet. Right. You know, they're they're they've just they're loud and proud, right. you know. And but then there are others that in the soft woke, it's it's more nuanced, it's less obvious. And I would say as a result, it's more dishonest, it's more cowardly, yeah. and it's more covert. Yeah. Like if if you're gonna go to hell, you know, as a dude wearing, you know, Cinderella slippers and changing your pronoun, at, at least at least you're going out, yeah. you know, with some integrity because you're being honest. Right. It's the soft, woke, the cowards, the compromisers in the middle that are harder to sniff out. Right. Absolutely. We call this the narcissism of small differences. So when people are um, politically aligned or affiliated with each other and they still have some minor differences between them. Uh, a lot of the time there can be very intense hatred of, <laughs> of people who actually have a lot Mostly in common. Mostly agree with them. Yeah. yeah it's, it basically, it's a, um, it's a purity yeah. mindset. Like you have to agree with me a hundred percent or else you're not good enough. And people who just admit that they are the, you know, my enemies, I respect that's them better. more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that seems to be what's going on here. Definitely. I think that's why a lot of Christians like Mark Driscoll like have more hatred towards progressive Christians mm. than they even do for atheists. Even though progressive Christians, they believe Jesus died on the cross for their sins and like on the big stuff, agree with him. Yeah. He has more hatred for them than he would for us. Yeah. I mean, that's an indication that someone's mindset is very tribalistic. Yeah. And it's not something that... Uh, you know, just conservatives do. People, oh, yeah. all kinds yeah. of groups do this. I'm just saying that he is a really great example of this. Yeah. Even when we went to Satan Con, it's like the people that were arguing with each other weren't the Satanists and the Christians. It was the different sects of Christianity that came to protest. The yeah. evangelicals were arguing and getting confrontational with the Catholics. Yeah. <laughs> Would be the things you're like these would be indicators of you're in that world and what happens is it's like gravity you only go down 
Right. So if you're on the slip and slide for soft woke, eventually you're going to end up apostate. Yeah. That's where you're going to end up. It's like literally, literally the slippery slope Yeah, I was going to say, like, that is the slippery slope fallacy. <laughs> uh, well said, Mark. So I, I think that there's a couple of things. So it is true that, um, you know, Augustine said in, um, in the essentials unity and the non-essentials liberty and all things love. I like that. Okay. Um, he d identifies that there are things that are essential in our faith, and there are some things that are non-essential in I our call faith. Them closed and open hand. Totally, yeah. And so, um, I think a good pastor, uh, somebody who cares about the Bible and Jesus, and you know, and has studied a little bit, will know that will tell his congregation these are things that are. Are closed-handed. These are things that are open-handed, and we'll define those things that are closed-handed, um, and then we'll define those things that are open-handed. The problem with fundamentalism: everything goes in this hand. Correct. So the Earth is six thousand years old, yeah, right. and there's a pre-trib rapture, yeah. and dinosaurs are a myth, yeah. and you know, speaking in tongues is demonic. And, right. and if you are supportive of any in any way of gay people, then you're going to hell. Right, Mark? <laughs> I would say that's a fundamentalist attitude. I mean, he, in my opinion, he is definitely a fundamentalist. Yeah. But it's like, I get what he's saying, but the fundamentalists he's referring to, like the creationists, they would say that that is closed hand. Like, that those are essential to yeah. being a Christian. And if you are open-handed about it or believe otherwise, then that means you're not a real Christian and mm -hmm. you're going to hell. Yeah made grape yeah. juice and, and if you have tattoos you're yeah tattoo, if you have a yeah. tattoo you know leviticus has yeah. already you know that's tagged it. you cuts yeah. in the line to hell that's it and the problem with the liberals and the progressives is everything goes in this hand they're like we're right. not going to fight over baptism speaking in tongues transgenderism or what Scripture. pronoun you want or yeah. whether or not i like how he mentions issues that are discussed directly in the new testament and then one that is an entirely entirely yeah. modern debate like had nothing to do with the new testament at all I, no one that wrote the new testament knew what transgenderism was yeah i i'm not sure if this is included in the stuff that i clipped but they go on to say how the bible is so um specific about th these type of things and like obviously in the bible transgenderism is not okay and i'm like I don't think the Bible really directly talks about that, but yet you're like so fixated on this one issue yeah. and like how if you're trans, that must mean you can't possibly be a Christian and you're going to hell. The Bible yep. is a series of myths yep. and fables or it's truths and realities. And so, I, I, and what you're seeing is a, a dire polarity. Right. And if you're forced to choose between these two categories, you're like, well, I don't want to be a dude in a dress. Right. But I also, you know, am going to drink whiskey right. and uh, and read something other than the King James Bible right. and do something other than churn my own butter in my homeschool co-op. You know, so there's got to be, yeah, there's yeah. got to be some options. That's exactly it. Sounds like you're soft woke there, Mark. You, you, you don't <laughs> yeah. want to live as a separatist away from the world. You want to drink alcohol which is something that's very intemperate. I mean, even Psalms say, uh, is, it, is it Psalms or Proverbs that say, uh, you know, who hath weary, who hath uh, redness of eyes? It's those who linger long at the wine or the whiskey. Mm -hmm. So uh, it sounds like you've gone soft woke according to, I mean, this is how absurd this is. Yeah, this he does is not so see stupid. when he is transgressing his own demands for Christians. It's, it's just yeah. stupid. Yeah, it's like it's not about what the Bible says. It's about how he personally interprets the Bible and what he thinks mm -hmm. is okay and isn't okay. And Mark Driscoll is super homophobic and transphobic, and he thinks being gay or being trans is ew. So therefore, the Bible says that it's not right. But that's pretty much what it boils down to. It also seems like the hotter the topic politically, the clearer the Bible is yeah, about yeah. this topic, right? Because no- like, Why are you fixating on this so much? Like fucking weirdo? In the late 1800s with the temperance movement, I mean, people were talking about that you, I mean, alcohol was one of the biggest dividing factors in American Christianity mm -hmm. around that time. So slavery and alcohol. And I mean, let's hope that he has, uh, certain ideas about slavery uh i imagine that he would be against that but with alcohol it's like 
no, this isn't, you know, I'm not worried about that. Only fundamentalists think that this is like a big issue. Well, it's because fundamentalist culture was forged in the cultural, uh, the, the cultural fire of the temperance movement of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. You wonder why they have all of these weird old things like churning butter and homeschooling in their culture. It's because their culture is from another time. The, the, and the theological issues are also from another yeah. time. People are going to see you as you, Mark, as having theological hangups that are from another time from, at some yeah. point. I, well, once again, though, I think that, yeah, I'd probably be a bit more like, okay, we'll have a conversation about okay, so that. So where would uh, gender go? Binary, male, female, you know, two bathrooms at Target like the old days. That would be closed hand for me. Closed hand? Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Um, what about marriage? One closed man, hand. one woman. Closed hand. Okay, uh, what about uh, what about all the charismatic stuff and the speaking in tongues and open hand, open hand? Okay, yeah, I don't believe that 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 uh, speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit. I think uh, tongues of fire on your head is the initial evidence of the Holy that would Spirit. Be awesome. <laughs> yeah, we kind of already addressed all of this. It's just that these are hot issues, especially for conservatives are really hot issues right now. And so that's why he thinks they're, you know, close fist or he's so strong about these. Yeah, charismatic, whether whether one is charismatic in their Christianity, whether you might dance or raise your hands or whatever, is not really a hot button issue. It's not something that people really talk about that much. So like, yeah, we can have an open hand about that because it's not a controversial dividing yeah. thing. It, it, it doesn't seem like... And he doesn't think those things are you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like theological significance is really the, the deciding factor here. It's no. the political, the current political significance of certain yeah, ideas. Yeah, which is why I say Mark Driscoll's preaching is just politics. Yeah. It's just politics. I think it's a salvation issue. Um, and um, yeah, there's... Uh... So would you say, here's, here's kind of my thesis. We used to have these different, I, I say there's national borders and there's state borders. Yeah. And in the state borders, you're still part of the same country. Once you cross a national border, you're a different nationality. Yeah. And some of these issues, I would say gender is a national boundary. Yeah. Male, female, marriage is a national boundary. Yeah. Once you cross those, you've left Christianity, yeah. you're into apostasy. Yeah. Um, but within that, I think it used to be that the teams and tribes and traditions, they would fight over what we now would say are open-handed and secondary issues. Mm -hmm. And here's my thesis, and I'll field test it with you. As soon as gay marriage was legalized, and I, I was up in the People's Republic of Seattle, so it kind of hit there first. And um, as soon as that was legalized, all the teams changed. Two dudes walk in, and they're like, can, can you officiate our wedding in your church? Right. If you say yes, you're on that side of the line. You say no, you're on this side of the line. And it's such a public issue, it's so visible I mean, it's not like whether or not you secretly believe in flat earth and, you know, and have your medical marijuana card. You right. know, it, that's kind of a private lifestyle choice. But it's so public that the people who believe the Bible come to one conclusion. The people who really don't believe the Bible come to another conclusion. And all of a sudden, I think issues like that, they just reorganized all the teams that you used to fight. Right. Yeah, I think that, I think you've, you've absolutely nailed it. Um, this is a, this is an obvious and over it is funny how he's basically directly stating what what, we what just, we're saying yeah. but not seeing that it's an issue yeah that it's an issue or that really he's choosing these subjects in a way that he himself defines as arbitrary you know if something is hot in politics that doesn't have any relevance to the gospel because the gospel is completely unchanging but then he's like Oh, issues that aren't hot right now, we, we have open hand open hands about. And hot topics right now, we have to close hands about. And that's how it should be. It's like, yeah. what? That is so, it's so hypocritical. And it's like in 50 years, there's going to be different hot, controversial topics. Mm -hmm. And maybe he'll be like, oh, you know, LGBT stuff, like that's not a big deal. We can have an open hand about that. But whatever is like hot and controversial in the future, he's be like, no, like we have to be yeah. closed hand about it issue in scripture um there's there are things that we should have conversations about and there's things that we need to have conclusions about and in our effort to please people or to not be the bad guy 
uh, pastors will just pass the buck and they'll just have, let's just have conversations. I was a part of a church that had So I was part of the emerging church. Yeah. So early on, I was in a young leaders thing. This was way back probably before the internet. And, you know, what they called the emerging church was really the submerging church. Um, it's like they're burying the thing. Um, but it all started with, I'll never forget, and it was the beginning of the deconstructionism. Yeah. And we were looking at Foucault and Derrida and Brody and Lyotard and all the early kind of postmodern deconstructionists. And, it, and that demonic spirit still lives, and, and all it is, it's a cancel culture, it's a critical culture, it's a deconstructionist culture. And I'll never forget... I was sitting at a dinner with some now pretty well-known apostate evangelical leaders. Um, and they were asking, like, well, what do you think about gender? And, 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 and I'm like, my dad hung drywall. Like, there's boys and girls, right. you know? And so because his dad hung drywall, he knows there's boys and girls? Because he was raised in a home which is less educated about these things, he is able to reach the right conclusion faster. It's just so weird to me how they're like so proud of being not analytical about stuff. Yeah. It's like not analyzing their life and just thinking so black and white. Like they're like proud of that. Yeah. I, I just, as a person who is very analytical, or at least I feel like I am. Yeah. It's just so strange to me. I don't yeah. know. I just don't get that. It's also funny to me how they talk about, oh, people are really nice because they don't want to drive people away. They're afraid to tell the truth because they, that's going to drive people away. But no, actually being like very soft about things, being very kind constantly, yes, will attract people for sure. But we know that, I mean, there are so many examples throughout history of loud arrogant, narcissistic, strong men also attract crowds of mm. people to follow them. And then it doesn't have anything to do with telling the truth. It doesn't yeah. have anything to do with the real gospel. It has to do with some people are attracted to kindness and softness and some people are attracted to, to aggressiveness, to ag some, aggression. Yeah, some yeah. people are attracted to Mark Driscoll's personality, which yeah. is why Mars Hill became as big as it was. It's because he was very charismatic and very like rough and gruff and like, there are some people that are attracted to that. Yeah. And I mean, from a Christian perspective, being this militaristic, aggressive, strong man can distract from, you know, the true gospel just as much as being too soft or too kind. Yeah. But he doesn't see that because being a strong man, that is something that his political tribe thinks is okay. Yeah. And if you don't know that, like, I don't understand you. It doesn't make any right, sense. Right. You know, like, and they asked, um, they said, no, we're just asking questions. And I said, well, that's where all the trouble started in Genesis 3. Right. <laughs> Satan was the first deconstructionist who showed up with a question. Right. Right. And Satan does the same thing to Jesus. How you can possibly say that with a straight face while also upholding yourself as some kind of intellectual leader is insane to me. Yeah, that's why I don't understand. Like, at first I was like, why would Michaela Peterson be so drawn to Mark Driscoll? Because he's an anti-intellectual. Yeah. Like, he purposely does not want to ask questions and discourages other people from asking questions. Yeah. And I don't understand how do you know what you believe is true or how do you know if anything's true if you're not willing to ask questions about it? Yeah. Did God really say? Mm. And so those who just say, we're just asking a question. Actually, what you're doing is spiritual warfare and demonic mm. because the wrong question leads a person to error right. and to apostasy. What? The wrong question might lead someone to uh, not think what you're saying is true. And... <laughs> Yeah, what? yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's kind of insane. It's crazy that, like, yeah, again, it's crazy that Michaela Peterson, this person who is da a daughter of this, you know, public intellectual, or he's really a polemicist, is really all he is now, but, and who has a podcast that is questioning things, trying to, like, learn and, and be an intellectual, would think that this person is someone that's different than the pastors that she's been exposed to who don't urge you to think yeah. and don't care about really understanding their stuff. I mean, he's 
literally saying asking questions is demonic demonic and of satan asking questions that's crazy to me but i mean he's all about authority and fall in line and you must do what i say mm-hmm. so he doesn't want anyone who follows him asking any questions because they he just wants them to do what he wants them to do. After all, we know that Jesus and the apostles never asked any questions of yeah, their followers yeah. or of the Pharisees that they disagreed with, that's for sure. Right. And so the red letter Christians, the progressive, the discernment people, the we're just asking questions and wanting to have conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are some things that are thus saith the Lord, their yep. convictions and conclusions. Yep. And they're settled. Yep. And if you're reopening them, it's because what you're trying to do is you're trying to actually uh, deconstruct and ultimately destroy Christianity. Right. So, so for those who are the progressive, and, and what you get is you get a lot of kids with church hurt and bitterness, and they were under legalistic parents or shallow teaching, and so now they're deconstructing their faith. Yeah. Talk about why those kids, and I call them kids because I'm 52, but some of the best known deconstructionists are my age. Yeah. They're now making a living deconstructing everything that they've actually taught. Yeah. What's the spirit? What's the impetus? What's the motivation behind just this ongoing deconstruction of Christianity? Maybe breaking from the idea that asking questions is demonic and actually caring about basing your beliefs in something rational. Maybe that's what it's all about. Oh, just wait. We're about to hear what they think it's about. Oh, God. Yeah. Are you ready? Okay. It's really simple. People just want to have sex with whoever they want to have sex with. So you think it's an underwear issue at the... Yeah. Most apostasy is really belt-related. Absolutely. I, I, I would... If I had to boil it down to one answer, I'd just say, I either know somebody who I love who is who wants to have sex with whoever they want to have sex with or I'm related to somebody who wants to have sex with everyone and they could never go to hell because they're my, they're my kid yeah you know or I want to have sex with whoever I, want. I don't want to be married to this person anymore yeah. and I want to have sex with whoever I want to have sex with yeah it's yep they're actually saying the only reason people deconstruct or become progressive Christians or leave Christianity is because they want to have sex yeah that's mm-hmm. You know, literally what they're saying. Yeah. Well, they 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 can read minds, right? They did they did uh, establish that at the beginning. <laughs> well, it's also like, have you guys asked people that have left Christianity? Have you asked progressive Christians what led them to the position they now hold? Because I, I mean, sure, maybe there are some who were like, yeah, I, I wanted to have sex with somebody. But from all the people we've talked to, and we know a lot of atheists, we know a lot of progressive, progressive Christians, sex had nothing to do with them, with what they believe now. Yeah. And also understanding your sexual orientation or gender or somebody else's sexual orientation or gender, or just understanding sexual orientation or gender differently as you learn Mm -hmm. is not the same thing as, well, I just kind of want to have sex. So I guess I'm just going to leave all this behind. Yeah, they they make it sound like it's so much simpler and more wrapped up in vice than it actually is. This, I mean, yeah, like understanding homosexuality differently did add. It was one small part of me understanding Christianity differently and leaving mm-hmm. Christianity, but it had absolutely nothing to do with me wanting to have sex with anyone. I was already married to you and satisfied with that. Yeah. Yeah. And like the same for me, like me leaving the church had to do with me realizing that the arguments really didn't hold up to scrutiny and that there's a lot of contradictions. And I, while I've always been attracted to women, I came out as bisexual and like explored that aspect of myself after I had already left. Like that wasn't the reason that I left. Yeah. To touch on the whole, they are just talking about hot button political issues right now as if they're everything to Christianity. Do you do you think that if these guys existed in the heat of the temperance movement in the 19th century, they would be saying, you know, 
there's there's really one ultimate reason why people leave Christianity. It's because they want to drink what they want whenever they want. They want to smoke what they want whenever they want. That's what it's about. That's all it's about. Or, I mean, if they would be saying that, yeah, because that's their personality type. I think it's 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 it's, it's all about who one wants to have sex with. I think that's the, the biggest motivation. So sex is fun. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. think, you know, probably all five-star Yelp reviews, yeah. you know, yeah. um, it is pleasurable. It is enjoyable. Um, but are we really at the point where if you just boil it down, sex is Lord or Jesus is Lord. And those are the two teams. Like, I want to have sex. Jesus says no. So sex is over yeah. Jesus. I want to have sex. Jesus says no. So I'm going to obey what the, what the word of God would say. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably the, the exact issue. I think that there's, you know, I, and I know that you'd agree with this, that that um, people have do have, you know, a doubting Thomas. You yeah. know, I mean, Thomas was with Jesus. He's like, dude, I'm with you. I just have a couple there's questions. There's between doubt and unbelief. Exactly. Doubt is like, I'm trying to figure out how this works. Unbelief is I reject it all yeah, together. Exactly. In Romans- Earlier, he's saying that asking questions, period, is demonic. Yeah, now he's saying it is okay to doubt, which is basically the same thing as asking questions. I was like, which is it? This is not, yeah, this is not working. <laughs> One, you see active unbelief and... and, and yeah, suppressing e- of the e- truth. Exactly. Yeah. Big difference, right? Between a guy who's just going, hey, I have a couple questions, you know? So, yeah, like, the, the Eve snake thing wasn't, I have a couple questions. It was, I want this. I want to be the master of my own fate, captain of my own destiny. I want to be reliant on God. I want to boink who I want to boink. Right. That was that was what we saw in Genesis chapter two. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I want to boink whoever I want to boink had anything to do with Eve eating the fruit. I think that he's just drawing an analogy between them. Okay. Um, okay. Although I will say Eve thinking that she was going to be the master of her own destiny isn't not I'm not exactly sure yeah. if I mean it's all, obviously it's all up for interpretation but I'm not sure that I Feel exactly like... interpret the story that way I think that's an anachronistic way of looking yeah. at that story uh, could you even say that Eve was able to understand what she was doing if she didn't have knowledge of good and evil in the first place I would not yeah. say so yeah, that doesn't make any point. sense but what this boils down to is everyone who disagrees with me is a bad person yep and that's the only reason they would ever do it is because they are they're bad. they're bad and they want to be bad. That's all. That is a great way to shelter yourself from ever having to deal with anything difficult. It shows massive, massive insecurity with your own self, your own identity, your own intellectual system that you tied yourself to. It's a. I think that Mark would not like it, but I think that um, I would say that that is one of the ultimate indications of an extremely weak man. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that he's extremely insecure. And yeah. so that's why he's like so attached to these highly masculine traits that he for some reason think are... Well, he was in- born with those traits. So he's got that advantage. So that, that that must be right, right? The way that the unchangeable things about me must be, must be fine. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Or the best. I mean, I don't even... I think he's kind of short, actually. I could be wrong, though. But maybe he has short man syndrome. I don't know. Hey, we in the alphabet squad love a short king, Mark. Yeah. I'm over, oh, well, I'm <laughs> over to the Rambo side. So to me, um, a, a lot of these th- kids who are asking, th- there's kids who are asking questions and they're not doing that from a place of, you know, uh, I want to be in control. They're going. I'm I, confused. They're confused. Exactly. I was talking to a kid yesterday who's just genuine. He's genuinely confused. Um, and it's because of other pastors who are genuinely confused. Um, Chesterton said something that, that uh, I absolutely love. He said, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, he said, uh, the purpose of an open mind is like an open mouth to close it again on something solid. Um, so a, a Christian is somebody who goes, yeah, I have an open mind about stuff, but I want to find what is solid and, and close it. I'm not going to have conversations about the day of Christ. I'm not having a conversation about whether scripture is profitable. Uh, I'm not having a conversation about sin, right? Like those, these, these are matters that are settled in, in, in Holy Writ. I'm going, I'm going there, right? Yeah. And yeah, um, there's going to be some nuance in there, but let's not call what's not nuanced, nuanced right? There's no nuance about sin. There's no nuance about gender. There's no nuance about human sexuality. I think that if you're not able to 
question or even have somewhat of an open mind about certain aspects of your belief, then doesn't that kind of show how easily your belief can be shaken if by simply asking questions could lead you to completely abandoning it? If you're not allowed to see any nuance at all or else you're an apostate, the moment that someone shows you the tiniest bit of nuance you're out the door. Yeah. And yeah, with with fundamentalism, it is it is kind of that way, you know, you show you show one series of transitional fossils that's convincing to people and fundamentalists are like if they're willing to look at it and actually see it, then they're like, "Oh my god, god's not real." Mm-hmm. Like and they're talking about all these pastors, you know, influencing kids to have these weak fragile faiths and it's like but that's exactly what they're doing just in a different way yeah in the in in the old testament or new testament it's so freaking clear um but it's interesting how something is so nuanced when we want to boink somebody yeah do you know what i mean it's like well this you know does did god really say you know it's like well it's crazy how something's so nuanced when you want to drink beer and get tattoos <laughs> he, he really did and you know that you just don't want to be married to this person anymore. Or you want to... Yeah. Or you have somebody in your life who doesn't want to be, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's where I think we all start there. But it's the job of Bible teaching, leadership, and pastors to help you move from there. That's it. That's Not it. Not to celebrate and tolerate, yeah. but to call to repentance and help to educate. Yeah. And, and that was me. I started that way. So my story, I didn't know God. I get saved reading the Bible. I go to church and they tell me that sex with your girlfriend is wrong. Fornication. Yeah. I never heard that F word in my whole life. Yeah. Like, and I'm sleeping with my now wife, pastor's daughter. And, uh, and so I call the pastor and I'm like, uh, so I got a friend. I, I, I'm afraid they're fornicating. I tell it was Grace. And, uh, and I'm fornicating with her. And he explains, like, no, they need to stop. If they're Christians, they need to obey God. There's no sex outside of heterosexual marriage. You're in sin. You know, he didn't say, but the person's in sin. They need to, so I called Grace. I was like, honey, we've been fornicating. She's like, yeah, I know. I was like, well, what the? <laughs> you know, That's was, so good. Yeah. And, and so she was suppressing the truth. And I was just, I was, I, I just learned the truth. Apparently he has this tendency, like in his sermons and his various books um, that he has. And a lot of his books are about marriage and sex that he like tends to throw his wife under the bus and say that it's all her fault. Mm. Like, just like like how he did, like, oh, she was suppressing the truth, but like basically saying that he wasn't really in the wrong because he didn't know what the truth was. Yeah. Um, But yeah, he he tends to do that and he tends to blame a lot of things on women. Yeah. The way he told that story does kind of seem to excuse his role in it and and blame his wife a bit. huh? Yeah. My first, I think my first Greek word study, I kid you not, was the word fornication. Okay. Porneia? So, well, it was in Corinthians where, you know, fornicators want to, or where Paul says fornicators want to inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. He talks about Timothy, he talks about Corinthians. But my whole thing was like, all of a sudden, I'm a brand new Christian and I became a theologian. Right. And I want to see what the Greek word for fornication means. Right. <laughs> not because I'm, you know, seeking the truth, right. but because, like, if there's any way. You're right. So um, what happens is I come to the conclusion, like, it says no. And I'm either going to say yes or right. agree and say no. Right. And I said no. Yeah. So I stopped sleeping with Grace. But eventually we got married. We've been faithfully married 30 years, you know, and there are guardrails that God puts. And it's not just the transgender or the homosexual or whatever it might be. It's for the married people, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I, I, I had a... I mean, yeah, there's, I guess, guardrails for married people, too, but they're still allowed to have, like, under this belief system, they're still allowed to have sex as long as they're married and as long as it's someone of the opposite gender. Yeah. But, I mean, other people, LGBT people, are, are not allowed to have sex at all. Yeah. You know, it's, like, kind of convenient and easy for him to say that when he is straight. Right. Yeah, throughout this whole thing, he has been making this point of, well, if you want to think a certain thing, if you want to serve your biases, you can, and you can do it in this way. And then he proceeds to do that for to serve his own biases. Yeah, yeah. It's like when, when you get so entrenched in a position and when you are like this dogmatic, aggressive, strong man that everyone's supposed to look up to and almost worship, then... 
you don't you're not serving your your own critical thought very well you end up thinking more dogmatically and just totally missing when you are doing exactly Mm -hmm. what you are saying everyone else is doing well he even admits that he's doing the exact same thing that everyone else is doing but for some reason it's okay and it's a good thing when he does it but it's not a good thing it's a bad thing when other people do it can you say authoritarianism yeah (laughs) that's how uh, that's how it often starts with men who are willing to do that and people who are willing to bow down to them yeah i mean i know mark driscoll and probably this man he's interviewing are incredibly insecure men that feel like they have to have control over other people and what they do and they don't want anyone who follows them to ever question anything that they ever say and i just think it's it's sad that they're that insecure it's sad that people would ever see someone having this conversation as an intellectual much less a a leader yeah i really hope michaela peterson finds a better pastor and doesn't keep idolizing mark driscoll because he's not worthy of idolizing. Thank you so much for watching and a huge thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible and an extra special shout out to all of my recent patrons. You guys are really helping me out. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you're interested in following me on social media, my Instagram is Taylor underscore the underscore antibot and my Twitter is the antibot. I should mention that I primarily post on Instagram. I don't use Twitter that often. So if you want to see kind of what I'm up to on a day-to-day basis, I suggest following me on Instagram. If you'd like to consider supporting this channel financially, a link to my Patreon will be down in the description, and I'll see you all in the next one. Say bye!